Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Natural Areas Management Services uh, fourth uh, webinar in the series about learning how to expand your green industry services to your clientele. We're hoping that this is going to help you diversify your business. Last week, we talked about land care practices for woodland health. And uh, this week, we're going to talk about the introduction to woodland health assessment and incorporating woodland health practices into your business. This webinar starts with an introduction to the woodland health assessment checklist, which is on page 67 and to 68 of your handbook. And we're going to learn how to use it to educate and motivate your clients to address issues with their property and management actions that you can offer. This checklist can be used to develop a land care plan. The plan further details land care practices for your client's consideration, marketing your services, and when to include a forestry professional for certain practices. A review of the webinar series will focus on benefits and challenges for this niche area of services, who to contact for more information, and suggestions on how to get started. So the chapters that we're gonna be covering in the Woodland Health Practices Handbook is chapter two and five. And of course, we're gonna be going over that checklist that's on page 67 to 68 of, our, of the handbook. So, um, hi, I'm Agnes. I'm one of your hosts tonight. Uh, you can see Andrew there. We've been uh, alternating host duties. Andrew's in the back of the house today. Um, he'll be letting people in and monitoring that chat. So we're glad to have you tonight and we thank you for registering and we're hoping that you're already seeing the benefits of joining us, finding these, finding this educational, connecting with other professionals and um, finding out about some different learning opportunities. As you all may know, this webinar is being recorded so people, participants are gonna be muted and the video is gonna be turned off. And uh, the recording can be found at extension.umd.edu backslash woodlands. Some more of our housekeeping items, as you know, and you may be familiar, uh, uh, continuing education credits are available. And to do that, if you remember from the other few weeks in the chat at the end of the uh, webinar, we're gonna put a link up there and you're gonna click on that link and you're gonna fill out that survey. Now, just be sure to remember that your name is the same that's uh, on the screen here in the webinar series, that it's the same name that you used when you registered. And that's the same name that you're gonna put in that, um, survey or form to fill out to get your CECs. That's going to make it a smooth transition to get those CECs where they need to go. And of course, we hope that you have questions and we definitely uh, encourage comments in the chat box. Um, those questions we'll get to at the end. So stick around and we'll get to those questions. Please feel free to type those in the chat box. As you may have been noticing, some of our partners uh, from Virginia Tech and um, Penn State have been also been part of those chats. So it's been very exciting to see what's happening in those chat boxes. Um, an evaluation of this webinar series will be sent out uh, within a week of, the, of now for your feedback, because that's really uh, valuable for us to learn how, how to uh, redo this and find out what you want to know more of or uh, what we could focus on differently. So today we have three great speakers. So today we have Julianne Schieffer. She has a formal education in urban forestry, botany, and tree pathology. Julianne's specialty is tree health. She's a board certified master arborist, a municipal arborist and promotes proper management of trees and natural resources in southeastern Pennsylvania communities as the extension urban forester. We have Joe Lanen. He is a forest utilization and marketing specialist coordinating the urban wood program for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Joe led the effort to establish the formation of the Virginia wood, urban wood group in 2017. 
He obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in Forestry and Wildlife Management from Purdue University and has worked for the Virginia Department of Forestry since 1979, spending most of his 33-year 33-year career as an area forester for the Shenandoah Valley work area where he, he and his family live west of uh, Woodstock. He also serves as a board member of the Virginia Urban Forest Council and is the Eastern U.S. representative for the steering committee of the Urban Wood Network. And our third presenter tonight is Jonathan Kays. He's a forestry specialist for the University of Maryland Extension for 30 years and his experiences in teaching, research, and technical assistance. He has developed and implemented extension programs in woodland stewardship, invasive species management, wildlife damage, man <laughs> wildlife damage management, natural resource income opportunities, handheld GPS, and wood biomass energy production. He is one of the primary authors of the Woods in Your Backyard Guide, first published in 2016, and then it's first published in 2006, revised in 2016. Jonathan has authored numerous extension publications and produces a free quarterly newsletter, Branching Out. Uh, that's a great resource if you want to get uh, on to, if you want to get that uh, newsletter, you can go to extension.umd.edu backslash woodlands. So without further ado, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll begin with the presentation. Y'all ready, Julianne? Okay, we're on. So I, I saw one of the things in the chat, they were saying, oh, um, that Woodland Health Assessment Checklist isn't in page whatever. And it actually is an additional part and in the addendum. Um, in the back. So here you have it and, and also can be downloaded as a PDF. So here you have it as um, a depiction on the right side of the screen. And the beauty of this simple little pamphlet is that it is a tool that lays out this really nice process to plan on what's happening with your woodlands uh, and with your client's woodlands. Um, in particular, it uh, allows you to walk through the different uh, management areas and to perform a health check with this really simple checklist. Um, so one page of your one page of your woodland health assessment will have uh, the different uh, checklist things and then the other side will have the management considerations. So the different categories we're going to go through with this checklist is woodland diversity and composition, woodland structure, habitat assessment, and the site level considerations. And your decisions are pretty easy. It's three choices. It's uh, and it's color coded. So red means aha warning higher concern, whereas on the right side, it's a lower concern, it's green, it's more of a healthy situation. And as I mentioned about um, each page has a suggested um, checklist categories on one side, on the left side, and the opposing side has the management actions. So if you can grab that so that you can look at it um, as we go through and it, it's pretty easy. So our first one is that woodland diversity and composition because every property is different. And so uh, what you want to be looking at is uh, the mix of tree and plant species because that's gonna be uh, there because of what site conditions, okay? so. Um, that anywhere that you have a diversity of native tree species is um, better for a healthier woodland or a healthier landscape. So on one side, you will see pictures uh, depicting um, maybe what would be a higher concern. And so this woodland here 
the woodland has low tree species diversity, as you can see, that's all one species. Uh, whereas on the other side, it has uh, a mix of not only different species, but also different age classes and different layers. So that is a far more healthy, healthy situation. So you have many tree species without a single tree species. Uh, being overly abundant. So um, our second category, our second uh, choice within the woodland diversity area is general tree health. And we're going to be looking at what's happening with the trees if there's poor form or uh, maybe a lot of dead branches, low vigor. Uh, we've had a lot of storm damage lately. And that'll show up in your woodlands. Uh, whereas on the other hand, if they appear healthy with well-formed crowns, form, um, that's where you will check more on, on the green side, on the right side. And of course, um, the yellow zone, the middle is, well, a little bit of each. So um, it's pretty easy to decide. Yes, no, maybe insects and diseases. And we're, what we're looking at here is hemlock woolly adelgid. And that'll be readily apparent if you have sparse crowns of different trees or tiny leaves uh, that will show that you have something happening towards insects and diseases. The middle picture is nectria canker. I have seen forests that are just riddled with the canker. It'll also show up as poor form and a lot of breakage can occur with that. Whereas, of course, on the right, you've got no current or looming forest insect or disease issues. And so uh, you choose on that green side. Okay, now we're gonna move into woodland structure. And uh, just as more diversity is healthier, uh, more structure is also healthier. And what we're talking about with structure is a diversity of canopy layers. Okay, so that means bottom layer might be an herbaceous layer, a shrub layer, an understory, or um, maybe subdominant species of trees, and then an overstory, those that are the largest, tallest trees that um, take up uh, most of the sun space, outer crown. Okay, so a diversity in tree sizes, ages, and again, the species again. So looking at that woodland structure. So it also can mean varying the number of trees per acre and dead wood, because believe it or not, dead wood is incredibly crucial for uh, a lot of our wildlife habitat and regeneration. And um, having a diversity of these conditions makes your woodland more likely to be resilient and to recover quickly when uh, things might strike it. So what we're looking at as far as uh, a higher concern is like a plantation forest of all one species, one age, it's called even aged, uh, and well, um, there's absolutely no canopy below that. It's just the discarded needles. And in fact, the website where I found this picture said, this is not a forest. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, which I, we might argue with that, but uh, not, not the healthiest forest, put it that way. Whereas on the right side, if you look at that, um, there's trees of all ages, sizes, there's multiple vertical layers of that understory, herbaceous layers, things like that. Um, re good regeneration. Our uh, second category, our second uh, choices in the woodland structure is standing dead snakes, or sometimes they'll call them wolf trees. And you actually want to have dead trees in areas where uh, they don't pose a risk to uh, 
human health or property damage. And those are trees that, um, depending on how high they are and how they're standing, different birds, different insects will colonize those heights, that um, vertical structure that you see on your, uh, within your forest uh, floor. So the easiest ones to see are those with a lot of the woodpecker holes, but that's indicating that there's a lot of insects that are at, at that point. Okay. And not only vertical dead trees that we'll want to see, but also downed and dead wood. So I know of some areas, uh, actually their developments, where they have a conservation ethic or a conservation landscape uh, through zoning, yet they will go through and take up all of the downed trees, all the dead brush, all the branches, and so-called clean it up, make it pretty. But actually that's not the healthiest situation because then you lack nurse trees, which lead to regeneration with new seedlings. I see some of the municipalities I work with establish grass under those trees. That's again, not the best situation. And then always cleaning up um, the uh, deadwood and uh, the things that drop over. So we actually want some of that. And then this is an interesting one with tree crowns and spacing. So if you have an overcrowded situation, and I know we talked about this earlier with crop tree management, but if your trees have small crowns, they're overcrowded, competing for growing space, uh, not enough light can reach the forest floor. And sometimes you end up uh, just harboring, for example, hay scented fern, which is, uh, even though it's a native, it prevents a lot of regeneration. What the research has been looking at is how spacing is um, situated within that overstory. And this on the right is a shot of what they call crown shyness. And this this illustrates the trees that have adequate growing space with large, well-formed, healthy. Uh, and it actually, with movement, these trees will abrade, the twigs and branches will uh, seek and create that space so that they don't compete with different species or species of the same. Uh, and so they're finding that that's uh, a pretty important thing. And uh, so look up that term crown shyness. I've only seen that starting to come about in the literature this year. Okay, our third category is habitat assessment. Uh, since many of our properties that um, are smaller woodlots and such, uh, usually they're kept for wildlife. Uh, we're looking at uh, the habitat assessment, okay? Because this is another way to look at the forest and to communicate with the property owner. So uh, as I started to explain, for example, with snakes and how different wildlife is adapted to different, what they call niches in, in those, uh, in the, uh, uh, the vertical and the horizontal structure within your forest. Same with um, the age and successional stages. So you'll see this depiction here of the old field succession. So uh, here in Pennsylvania, at least, a lot of our old farm fields have grown up. First, there's pioneer species, and then the next uh, tolerant, more um, shade tolerant species goes comes into play until you have more the mature or the climax species, which um, here in Pennsylvania can be oak, hickory, maple, um, trees like that. So what we're seeing is if you have numerous successional stages, you have a lot more diversity for uh, 
birds, for example. So there's certain birds that only can take early successional stages. Okay, so successional stage is one. Now let's look at your edges, where you have a very abrupt, or say you have lawn going right up to your forested areas, that would be of a higher concern. That doesn't offer cover or uh, transitional zones that wildlife tends to like. So the other two pictures here show more of what they call a soft edge and have a transition into the more mature trees within the forest. And of course, we can all agree that uh, with a lot of our invasive species, uh, which are um, defined in many different ways, but uh, they are ones that outcompete some of our native vegetation. And sometimes even our native vegetation can outcompete um, any regeneration that we might have. So, what we have here, uh, I think a lot of people uh, wouldn't argue with me that uh, Philadelphia has some pretty extremes with. Uh, undesirable plants. I, a lot of things have been introduced in those areas through different estates or even packing materials. And so we have a shot here where uh, the Philadelphia Parks and Recreation did an incredible project. It was on a steep slope in one of their parks and they took out all of the invasive species, all of the Norway maple, it was mostly nori maple. So what they left was certain natives and they have uh, planted in a shrub layer and native trees. And so they know this will be long-term. They know that it'll take a lot of work, but we're all watching it because um, we're confident it'll work. So uh, if you have a lot of tall vines, uh, we have kudzu, I'm, I'm sure you all do too at this point, uh, that will lead to a lower concern area. Whereas if you have more of a mix of uh, native vegetation and less of um, the invasive plants, that would get that higher ranking. Deer browse. Okay, so of course on the left, uh, where you can see a strong browse line where the deer are reaching up and uh, there's actually not enough food for them that they are um, really kind of desperate and eating everything out of house and home, no regeneration. That's where you would have that red category. Whereas on the right where the deer can live, there is low deer density per acreage and um, you've got your layers of uh, vertical stratification of plants, of vegetation. And our last uh, under habitat assessment is the tree seedling regeneration. So what we're looking at on the left is hay scented fern. And because of the leopathy from this plant, nothing can get through. Uh, so on the right, we see some oak coming through and the healthiest forests are going to have some desirable tree seedlings and saplings. So again, that mix of ages, but at least you have the next generation coming through. Now we're gonna move into the site level category, those considerations, there's four of them. And so you might have an, an inaccessible area. We tend to have that in a lot of our cliff and rocky regions. Uh, it's interesting because uh, there in uh, the Wissahickon of the Philadelphia area is some of the oldest rock in the nation because that's where um, the original Pangea started splitting apart. And so you, you actually have them millions of years old. And so we had these worn down rocky areas, but if you wanna do something or get 
a tractor in there, it can be kind of tough. Uh, the other thing that might happen is if you have too wet of an area or if uh, the area is actually landlocked. I know of a few forested situations that that's one of the problems, okay, as opposed to having trails and access, really good strong access. And uh, in some cases, this isn't going to apply, so you just check that, skip it. But uh, streamside, looking at the healthiest areas, you are going to see wide, flat, uh, where the water actually spreads out. Uh, and you have those riffles and the different uh, um, speeds of the water in one area. You can easily see an unhealthy situation where, for example, if um, lawn is all the way up to the edge of the stream, if there's heavily cut uh, banks and uh, very few stream crossings. And uh, I'll admit that uh, here in Pennsylvania, we've got Stroud Center for Water Research and they have some excellent publications that you can download about how uh, they've done decades of research to show how the healthiest forest will have riparian areas of trees, uh, at least 25 to, well, actually they say up to 100 feet, they prefer 100 feet, and uh, what those streams really look like. Because most of us, at least in the southeast Pennsylvania area, are used to these eroded banks. Okay, wetland areas, if you have them. Uh, in some cases, they're going to consider a ditch, a wetland area, because it can function as a vernal pool. Uh, as many of us know, a vernal pool is crucial habitat for where amphibians and other creatures will uh, populate, repopulate, um, mate, and, and carry on. And uh, they're actually one of my favorite landscapes. But uh, if you have a ditch with no vegetated area around, or if you have um, just a seepage because the soil got compacted maybe, uh, those aren't the healthiest compared to a vegetated or a wetland forest, uh, which you'll see on the right side. Okay. So when I was thinking of topography, I was thinking of uh, Glen Anoko Falls, which is a Pennsylvania Game Commission property that has been shut down since the last year because it became too dangerous. Uh, I've hiked it many times. And uh, boy, um, what became the uh, tipping point was when a lot of people were doing foolish things and had to be rescued. And the rescue, the emergency vehicles, plain and simple, couldn't get in there. And to have to walk in litters and all these things to carry people out became exceedingly difficult. So um, topography, that can limit a lot of your options when we're looking at management. Whereas if you have nice level areas and it's pretty easy to get through, well, kind of obvious, common sense, it makes it much easier. Okay, well, those were the four categories that we look at with the different choices underneath each. I'm gonna talk briefly about pricing and there's uh, several different ways to look at it. Hourly, uh, and that might mean um, a different rate uh, for plans such as this versus different rates for when you're doing the actual work. So I've seen some where they have had um, a plan made and that was one fixed price. And then anything other than that would become an hourly uh, fixed price. And in that hourly, they would count the travel time too. Okay. Uh, then there's uh, choices of overall package deals where you might focus on the priority areas and uh, kind of lump it into a package price for specified practices. And um, 
then there's annual inspection and services. And, and this is kind of akin to, in the green industry, we have integrated pest management, which relies on inspections and then services based on if there is management needed. And so that's uh, something that could work very well towards this. And if a property, for example, signed up for uh, maybe inspections every one, two, three years, and you give different prices based on that, um, and then what services are needed would be extra. Okay, other ways to look at this is uh, by the practice or by the acreage. And then, of course, it makes sense if you don't have, for example, the forest pesticide license, that you might want to uh, work with someone and subcontract. So you would be the contractor and you would uh, act as, as the consultant setting up the subcontractors for the different other services that might apply to the property. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm delighted to have Joe Lanen uh, talk about, well, the rest of the story. Thank you, Julianne. Gosh, that was just an absolutely wonderful presentation. I am Joe Lanen, and I'm going to be pulling up my slides here in just a second. You know, Julianne did a great job of taking us through the planning process, and we do have a plan. Uh, so now what? You know, one thing I've learned in many years of my forestry experience is that landowners will get a plan, and then, you know, they'll read it, and then it will sit on the shelf. Uh, now, that's not all landowners. I mean, some landowners are really good about calling you right back as soon as they got their plan because they are ready to move forward and they want that metal tomorrow. Uh, but anyway, you know, there are those folks that, uh, you know, that don't necessarily act right away. And so what do you do? Well, follow up is going to be very important to your plan. You know, once you prepare it, once you give them a preliminary idea of what they should do, you know, hopefully, they will call you and ask for follow-up advice. But if they don't, you know, a reminder is not a bad idea. You know, just say, you know, kind of, hey, you know, we were out uh, a couple months ago and uh, we were wondering what you thought of the plan, if you had any questions. And, um, you know, maybe you wanted to uh, move forward with it. So follow-up is going to be very important uh, in a lot of these cases. What I'm going to do over the next uh, few minutes is... Um, Look particularly at some of the suggestions that you see in the Hardy's plan, uh, which is found on page 62 of your book. It's going to look something like this. Of course, the Hardy's plan has nice writing in it. And, uh, you know, we'll go over a couple of the ideas that have been presented in the Hardy's plan. And, and hopefully kind of walk, your, walk you through, uh, you know, what you might see. Uh, so I am literally going to take you into the woods. Before we get there, you know, one of the things that we have found for what we call the, the small parcel dwellers of 2020 is there's usually about four top objectives uh, that they want for their property. Now, these things flip around, you know, depending on the person, but aesthetics is always a big one. You know, they want it to look good. I mean, you know what I mean? They want it to look good, but they also want it to be natural, but they also want wildlife. And so your job is to try to balance all of that and uh, give them sort of the product they look, they want, excuse me, uh, but on the other hand, to try to meet all the relevant objectives. People who have small parcels are very, very in tune to forest health. Uh, they literally can probably tell you, you know, if a tree looks a little bit off uh, from day to day. Um, and so they're very in tune with their forest how it looks, what's going on. They may not know why. And of course that is where you would come in. Um, they love wildlife. As long as the wildlife don't eat anything or hurt the kids. Uh, you know, they love the fact when they see a deer uh, walking across the property and into yonder woods. They do not necessarily like the deer when they're right outside the picture window eating their shrubbery. Uh, recreation is also very big, and it's been very huge during these COVID times. You know, people who have these small properties, you know, they had 
a lot better life than the apartment dwellers uh, in some of the bigger cities uh, when we were in like total shutdown due to COVID. Uh, so recreation on their own property has become uh, probably one of the top objectives uh, during these um, past few months of the COVID crisis. So this, you know, this is their, their home range, so to speak. And, you know, people are kind of like wildlife. Uh, they have their home range and people have their home range. And, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, hopefully you can. But the home range is this mode area, uh, kind of right around the house. It's where they frequent most often. It's where they conduct most of their activities. And it's where they also do the most maintenance. If they kind of drift out into the woodlands around the home range, they get lost. Not literally, but maybe figuratively. And what I mean is, is it's not familiar territory. They're not exactly sure of the processes that go on out there in yonder woods. And so consequently, you know, they need some good advice as to, you know, how to coexist or maybe even how to manage that area around their home range. And so this, of course, is where uh, the service providers and resource professionals come in. One of the things that they mention in the Hardy plan is, is the old fence row uh, down, I guess, in the southeast corner of the property that kind of divides this habitat and another habitat. And uh, another thing that they mentioned in the Hardy plan is, uh, you know, the lack of structure in mature forest. Well, a couple things in this picture. Uh, one, pretty obvious, is you do see the fence row. Uh, two is the fact that you see some honeysuckle growing on the fence row. Now, you might think, well, well, you know, it's just that little bit of honeysuckle growing on the fence row, and, and it's just there. Well, that's true. But I think most any land manager will tell you the best time to control invasive species is when they are at endemic levels. In other words, when you see a little clump of something, that is when you want to try to get it under control. And here's the reason. If you go over into that mature forest and you start to do chosen tree management, or you know, if you look at that picture, you'll see some of the trees are a little bit bigger. Uh, so you might actually be thinking of not only chosen tree management, but maybe even selling some saw timber out of that uh, forest there. What's going to happen? Well, you know, the canopy is going to be suddenly opened up, sunlight is going to come in, and that little bit of honeysuckle right there is all of a sudden going to become a lot of bit of honeysuckle right there. Um, and so what was a minor problem at one time may all of a sudden become a big problem. And this is a good example. You know, this is a forest that at one time was thin. I uh, got a flush of uh, vegetation, which was great. Uh, but a lot of that vegetation that came in was invasive species, including stilt grass. I know a couple of weeks ago, we talked about stilt grass in the forest. A lot of people who don't know stilt grass will look at it and they'll be like, oh, wow, we've got some really great grass out in the forest and it looks great. Well, no. Um, and of course, that's your job. You know, part of, the, of getting into this business is not only doing, but it's also educating. And so that's something that we'll talk about a little bit further in my presentation, but educating the landowners about invasive species. What's a good plant? What's a plant you might not want to have? And then to kind of go from there. One of the reasons I showed the goat is two goats are twofold. Uh, one is it shows how innovative you can be when trying to control invasive species. Now, granted, we are not trying to uh, convert you into goat farmers or goat herders, uh, but you know, this is, like Julianne was saying, an ideal situation where you can think about maybe doing subcontracting. You know, there are people, uh, like in Virginia, we have goat busters, uh, which is actually an invasive species control outfit uh, that runs goats into areas uh, where there are invasive species and manages the herd. Uh, and it's, it's just, it's great. I mean, it's absolutely wonderful uh, you know, it's a wonderful tool to try to control invasives in a very unique and interesting way uh, that the families would truly probably enjoy 
uh, to be able to go out and, and look at the goats and watch them do their thing. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, the goat busted goats. Uh, the herd usually comes with guard dogs. The guard dog usually stays right there with the goats. And, uh, you know, it's a great system. It really is. Here's a helpful hint that some of you may know and some of you may not know. But if it's green in the wintertime, and we're kind of headed in that direction right now, more than likely, it's an invasive species. Now, granted, we do have broadleaf evergreens, you know, like holly or like rhododendron uh, that you'll see growing in yonder forest. Uh, but beyond, you know, some of the broadleaf evergreens, you know, if it's green this time of year and it looks like it shouldn't be green this time of year, more than likely it's invasive like this privet. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. You don't want to go out there and spray everything that's green this time of year in the forest. But if it's green, it may be giving you a hint as to what's going on and that it is an invasive species. When you deal with properties such as this, you know, you're going to find that there are um, very manageable new or younger forests. Uh, forests like you see here, uh, which, you know, it's pretty obvious the land is going through forest succession. You see the carcasses of the pines, uh, you know, that have died out over time, uh, being replaced by hardwoods. And you can envision uh, being able to go in and do chosen tree management on a landscape like this and be very successful, uh, you know, in that practice. However, there are also new forests that may be a true challenge. Um, you know, not all properties present the same equal opportunities. Some of them are truly challenging. And so consequently, you, know, you really have to think, okay, you know, what am I going to manage in there? Uh, you know, to kind of give you some background of this scenario, uh, this is mostly box elder. Um, box elder is a, a type mm -hmm. of tree that you know, uh, can be no. um, truly uh, challenging no. to manage. And so consequently, you know, you might want to think, mm, you know, what am I going to do with that? Not only that, but if you see this during this time of year, you'll think, mm, okay, well, that doesn't look too bad. That compost could be dumb. But on the other hand, um, oh, is there? Okay. you know, on the other hand, um, I think that uh, during the summertime, this place is a jungle uh, with the vines and everything else growing up in here. I mean, you cannot literally see to the top of that little knoll there during the summertime. So when you get into a situation like this, you know, the best option might be a reset. Um, I don't know how many of you, I know we talked about forestry mulchers before. Not sure how many of you have either used them or seen them. Uh, they are, they are handy little machines without a doubt, and they can do a multiple, um, multiple things, you know, as far as land management goes. Uh, this one here, uh, for instance, you know, you can see it's been putting in a trail, uh, so they can be used for uh, trail establishment. Uh, managing understory invasives uh, is certainly something that you might consider doing uh, with this type of tool. Now, now, granted, you know, this is not necessarily a one and done. Uh, you know, of course, any type of management is not a one and done. Uh, so they're not the cure all, but they're just another tool in the toolbox uh, that can be used when it comes to certain situations for land management. And even helping out, you know, a small pine plantation uh, like you see here, where the pines are really struggling. I think um, uh, Jonathan, uh, Thankfully, let me borrow this slide, and I think he said this was like eight foot horsetail, um, which you know is just a, a giant type um, plant uh, that was totally overtopping uh, these little pine trees, and they're really struggling. And, and so, to try to help them out a little bit, uh, you know, they, they did bring in a forestry mulcher, and that seemed to uh, take care of the problem. Younger trees are often great for chosen tree management opportunities. And Julianne talked a little bit about this. Um, you know, and, and really, when you think about it, you know, you folks that are entering into this business as service providers, you might go out and see a situation like this, and you're like, mm, you know, those trees are pretty reasonably sized. I feel fairly comfortable about going out there and maybe doing, you know,
chosen tree next to the core of the land. But, but they're not overly big. Uh, you know, they're, they're not um, overwhelming as far as size goes. Um, the one thing to remember, and, and Julianne kind of touched a little bit about this, is when you're talking about chosen tree management, you always want to look up. If you look at this, you might think, oh, well, you know, those trees are spaced apart. You know, they've got probably at least 15, 20 feet between them. But what's happening up here is probably the most important thing. Uh, because the crowns need to be able to expand and grow. If they don't have enough space to expand and grow, then the diameter growth down here is going to be, you know, subdued or even minimal. Uh, the more crowded things get up here, uh, you know, the, the, it definitely affects the diameter growth of the tree. Um, and, and I'll tell you this right now. And, and Adam Downing or any of the foresters will tell you this. You get two foresters out in the woods doing chosen tree management, and sometimes they'll stand there and argue over whether to leave a tree or take a tree for five or ten minutes. It's it's a combination of science and also art. It's, it's something that you don't learn overnight. Um, and so consequently, you know, it does take practice and it does take guidance. And, and any forester will tell you it takes a while to learn and figure out. Uh, the trees out in the woods are not evenly spaced, although they were in Julianne's pine plantation as she showed earlier. But, um, you know, it's, it's one of these things that it just takes a while to learn and truly become pretty good at chosen tree management. And there's also the older forest. You know, like we know that the hardies do have older forests. And it gets to the point that the trees get really big. And you're thinking, you know, I, I'm a logger and, and I don't want to get a skidder and I'm a loader and none of that stuff. And so it may get to the point, you know, where, as we say, it's time to call for help. And we're not talking about the landowners now. We're talking about the new service providers that are entering into this small parcel management. Calling for help is okay. All through my career, you know, I call for help. You know, I obviously didn't have all the skills, uh, you know, all the technical areas uh, that that was necessary to give a good product to the landowner. And so consequently, you know, that's your goal is to give a good product and a good service to the landowner. It doesn't matter if you have to call in for some outside advice or outside counsel uh, to have a site visit by somebody else, that's okay. It really is. And, and believe me, you know, it's going to add uh, to your credits with the landowner uh, that, that they know that, you know, you are seeking the best advice that you possibly can get for them. And of course, you want to involve the landowner in on the discussion too, uh, so that they can hear the experts in these areas. When it comes to big trees like this, and you're thinking, well, you know, okay, uh, we know that we need to get more sunlight to the forest floor, but we're talking about saw timber harvesting here. And so when we're talking about saw timber harvesting, then it may be time to, you know, involve a consulting forester uh, who could help with this saw timber sale, who could find timber companies to come in here and do this type of work. And so, you know, again, um, work and provide the services up to a point that you're comfortable. But when you get to the point that you're not just not quite wanting to go that extra step or or to, to take that extra leap as far as um, equipment or whatever, then it's time to, to call in somebody else. Well, as we know, the Hardy family wanted to reduce the amount of mowing time. You know, I mean, he's rocking uh, his... Uh, um, mower here and, and he loves the zero turn thing but you know on the other hand you know it was just time that, that he gave some of it up so you know he got the hardies went to town and, and they saw this beautiful planting and they took a picture of it and they brought it back to you and they said you know this is what we want this is you know the meadow early successional type of landscape that we want on our property and this is where we want it in our grassy lower field. You know that the Hardys decided to stop mowing about two years ago. 
Well, the only thing is, is if you look at this grassy lower field, you will see that it is just chock full of Johnson grass. Johnson grass is one of the more challenging things to try to control. You know, not an easy uh, control uh, type thing. And so consequently, you know, you may want to call for help. And that, again, that's okay. You may not be used to Johnson grass. You may learn after this one time, you know, and actually doing it, how to do it and how to do it well. But for that first initial step, that first initial entry into controlling an invasive species that might be a little challenging, call for some help. It's okay to do so. Uh, the Hardys also talked about establishing um, a new forest. Uh, and again, you know, this is something uh, this is not that easy, or excuse me, not that difficult to practice to try to learn how to do. Um, one thing that was mentioned a while ago, uh, maybe two sessions ago, we were talking about the, the grow tubes. The tubes, you know, they serve a couple different purposes. One, of course, is that they act as a mini greenhouse to get the hardwoods up and growing. And you may look at a situation just like this right here, and you'll say, so they've really come out of the tubes well, especially, you know, some of the faster growing species and they look great. You know, it's time to take the tubes off. Well, you know, slow down uh, because, uh, you know, you may have these beautiful trees, these beautiful young trees uh, with maybe, uh, maybe a two or three inch caliper stem. And if you take those uh, plastic tubes off, those growth tubes, you know, what's going to happen kind of about the fall of the year, about this time of year or a little bit earlier, you know, they're going to be deer and they're going to come around and they're going to horn up these trees. And all of a sudden, you know, you've lost all the growth and, and all the potential on these trees because literally, you know, if they're horned up enough, deer can kill them. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. Um, you know, my general practice over the years have been is just leave the tubes on. And if it gets to the point that, you know, you do have to cut them off, uh, then, then go ahead and do that. Uh, but it will protect the, you know, the stem of the tree, which is very important uh, because it can really set back, you know, your, your, um, your whole project. Here's another situation uh, that Julianne kind of showed. You know, what if you get to a landowner and you're faced with this? And the landowner wants to stabilize the bank. You know, Ranger Joe here is not going to attempt that. It's going to be more than trying to, you know, put basket willow whips in at the, at the water line on these on these vertical banks. You know, so again, you know, in situations like this that you come upon, that you're going to come upon when you should, you know, seek outside help. Um, one of the best friends that I have are the folks at the USDA, um, either be NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, or the Soil Water Conservation District. Uh, you know, they can certainly help uh, to, to bring in, you know, the folks that are needed uh, to help repair something like this. And, and this is not an easy fix by any stretch of the imagination. And it may not be a cheap fix, uh, but you know, folks like this are there to help you. They help me all the time. I mean, I can when I was a, an area forester in the Shenandoah Valley, I consulted these folks all the time, and I learned so much from them. Uh, so you know, they are certainly a wonderful resource to have. Same is true for the folks with the wildlife division. Uh, in Virginia, it's uh, the Department of Wildlife Resources. They just got a rename. Uh, they are, they've got biologists, private land biologists uh, that will come out and provide advice, not only to, uh, uh, you know, landowners, but also to those people working on the land. Uh, so they are certainly, you know, a wonderful asset and a wonderful resource to have. Wrapping this up, make sure that your clients have realistic expectations like Julianne or somebody who was talking about in chat, they might, might want to say, I want to clean the forest, okay? The number two objective or the number one objective might be, I want wildlife, but then they you know, present you with, I want to clean the forest. Well, the, the forest doesn't necessarily need cleaning 
unless you know they're in an interface area and they need fuel reduction around their house. So again, you know, part of being a service provider is providing good conservation education to your clients. The same thing is true as you'll hear this, my forest is dying. Just look at it. Look at the dead trees on the ground. Look at this dead tree here. One dead tree or a few dead carcasses of trees on the ground, you know, does, does not necessarily qualify as a, as a um, Armageddon type situation in under forest. But again, you know, it's up to you to be able to tell them the natural processes. I want to plant oaks in my understory. And I know that's not the best slide, but that understory shrub, which I think is mostly witch hazel, you know, it's about six or eight feet tall. You can't necessarily, you know, do everything you want to do unless you want to spend, you know, a lot of money or a lot of time and effort, uh, you know, doing it. So again, good education is, is key to being a good service provider. Yeah, I know this one's a little bit funny, uh, but um, yeah, well, I'll just leave this where it is. I want to attract waterfowl. I'm going to leave you with uh, one of my favorite quotes. The soil is the foundation upon which a forest grows and management is accomplished. You're not going to attract waterfowl here, nor are you going to grow saw timber type trees. So the soil that you deal with is going to have a lot to do you know, with the management that is accomplished on the land. So, you know, wrapping up quick, you know, what services are you going to offer? Well, invasive species control and tree planting, you know, they're fairly straightforward. Meadow establishment, trail construction, wildlife habitat development, forest thinning. That's, you know, I think may take a little bit more skill set. Prescribed burning, you might think, mm, I'm not doing that. Uh, you know, setting fire to younger property and having it race across the landscape. I'm not sure I'm quite ready for that. Some people will be, but a lot of people won't be. So it's up to you to decide, you know, exactly what suite of services you want to offer. And you may try some for a while and, and think this isn't working well at all. And so consequently, you know, you might want to back off and, and reconsider, retool the business model. Um, and and you, you're going to get to know your clients and you're going to get to know what more of them want and what more of them don't want. Uh, I think we had the discussion maybe two or three sessions ago that prescribed burning, you know, may not work just because of local regulations of the neighborhood it's in and et cetera. Um, and so, you know, that may not even be, you know, within the list of things that you ever want to offer, but it's certainly something to consider based on whatever location you are. But the word of the day is maintenance. What is it? Maintenance. That's right. When you are thinking about doing these plans for people, always build in a maintenance or follow-up schedule. Nature does not stand still. Once you establish a trail, once you establish a meadow, once you do wild habitat development, it's not static. It's a very dynamic type thing. And consequently, you know, you want to make sure, you know, that you're thinking down the road for your client and down the road for your services and your business. Last but not least, as Lucy Van Pelt would say, we're here to help you. Just remember that everybody who presented from all the states are here to help you, you know, if you have questions or to build your business. So that is going to be it for me. And Jonathan is going to take us home and wrap up the series. And I'll do a stop share. So I'm the, uh, I'm the cleanup guy. And uh, maybe I'm supposed to be the motivational speaker here get you guys all psyched to, to go out and do some of this. And my job here really is just to kind of uh, summarize some things we've heard, give a few uh, messages to think about. I'm going to probably go through a few slides um, quicker than I might just because I, I we're at 8 o'clock. And uh, so if you can give me 15 minutes, uh, I should be able to, to finish up. And then we can take questions. Um, so where, what do you do now? That's really the question, I think. Uh, 
this is out of the uh, page three of the book, this kind of flow chart, you know, you've, the first thing is, you know, attending this training. Well, check, okay. But all these other things in terms of, you know, uh, trying to understand your clients, using the checklist and developing a land care plan, if, that, if that's their interest and, and, you know, hopefully contracting some of these services and, uh, you know, helping your clients uh, to be successful. Uh, just with the mention of uh, invasives, I, before I forget, this picture you see here on the right, where you're looking at that landowner to the right, actually they, her and her husband manually cleared all the invasives out of there. It used to look like what's in the back there, 10 to 12 foot bush honeysuckle and autumn olive. And uh, this is one of those cases where I think uh, as they, the, the additional parcel they bought there, they're looking at getting mulcher. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, just for, for what it's worth. Uh, so what do you have now? We, we have these, the original resource for the woods in your backyard. You have the um, Woodland Health Practices Handbook. You have the checklist. You know, and our goal here was really to expand, help you expand your Woodland Health Services, you know, for landowners, for your clients, uh, and improve, you know, the income and services offered uh, by your company. Uh, you also have these two resources. One thing I would really impress upon you, many of you uh, work with landscapes. You're used to varieties and this and that, made no maple and this and that. We're really talking about really learning your native trees and shrubs and uh, being able to use these guides and to, to uh, work with your clients with them. I, I will tell you, nothing will give you more credibility with a client than if you can identify trees and shrubs and you can maybe point things out to them how to identify it. It really gives you a lot of credibility that you, oh, this is something I actually know something about. And I, and I think for, for, uh, for some of you, this may be a little bit of a new area because you're more used to working in you know, managed landscapes where it's not all native vegetation. So just a little something to think about. Uh, at the end of the guide or the handbook, it refers to a resource list. So what is this resource list? Well, it's located at, at, at our University of Maryland website on the bottom, but, and it's in the book, but this is a list of resources that we have obligated to keep up. Um, and if you look at the different headings under each of these headings, under each of these links, it's a number of uh, publications and resources that are credible. So for example, if you look down at uh, herbicides, you know, Dave Jackson talks a lot about herbicides and the, the Penn State publication would be under there. And, and there's a bunch of other topics as well. So, uh, you know, feel free to use this. And if you have other resources that you think that we ought to use and include in here, please, you know, send them to us. Um, we would appreciate that. Um, so what are some of the take home messages here? Um, I think you've all learned something new. I at least hope some of you have. I, I find with working with landowners as well as with a lot of folks is that, you know, learning about how natural systems work is, is, is a new thing, you know, uh, you know, a little bit about ecology and how this all works together. And it's exciting. And, uh, you know, if you can kind of um, uh, impress that on your clients, I think, you know, they'll pick up on that. Um, of course, the opportunity here is to expand services to existing and new clientele. Uh, one thing that's been mentioned is this idea that, you know, a number of these practices uh, are things that can be do off season, you know, invasive control, uh, managing vines. When you, and when you can see the woods and there's the leaves and you can get around and you have to worry about the heat and, uh, you know, everything else, uh, all the better. Uh, uh, you know, even site prep for planting. So um, that's, uh, that's, that's something that could help keep you uh, or some of your some of your employees, you know, busy in the in the off season if you have clients. So maybe you, you know, your clients you're not going to be doing this work right now, uh, but you're going to be doing it in the winter. Now some things have to be done during the growing season, but um, just trying to make the point. And the final thing here is that, and Joe mentioned this, but there's a lot of these cost share programs out there. You know, federal and cost share program that pay the pay the uh, a significant amount of the cost of like some tree planting, uh, even some forest improvement, uh, wildlife habitat improvement. Uh, I wouldn't lie to you to say that some of them aren't unwieldy, especially the federal ones require you, you know, actually getting filling out papers and all this for the landowner to do that. But um, they can also make you as a service provider eligible as a, a, a service, pro you know, technical service provider or a person who's eligible to actually provide these services for others. Uh, and this may be even uh, different, you know, forest woodland owners who, uh, uh, or, or identify themselves as woodland owners uh, and not just residential clients. 
So it's something to think into, something to check into, and uh, checking with your, your farm, local farm services agency and checking with your uh, state forest agency is, is a good way to get started there. So, you know, we have arborists, we have landscapers, we have foresters, probably a lot of the folks that are involved in this training with, you know, your own interests and uh, own things that you do. And so we're talking about alternative services. And the idea here is also to think about how you can develop relationships between those folks as well. So, I mean, if you're a landscaper, if you have some person who's uh, needs tree work, you know, do you have an arborist that you uh, recommend them to? Or if an arborist, you know, who feels that really doesn't want to do this type of work, you know, with invasive control or other things, do they have a landscaper that they work with? Uh, there's the opportunity to refer each other as well as with Forrester who may be able to work with a landscaper to or others to kind of give better prescriptions or to maybe do things that uh, uh, the individual's un, uh, you know, uncomfortable with. So you know, just something to think about. So the opportunities here you know, are on small acreages um, uh, that we're talking about with a mix of open and, and, and residential land, uh, as we've talked about, which is the whole focus of this. And, and the thing I wanna leave you with here is that, you know, when you start talking to your clients, try and keep this idea of wildlife in, in mind. And how, how are you thinking about wildlife is that you're really thinking about managing habitat. You know, you're managing succession. You know, you're cutting something, you're planting something, or you're doing nothing at all, okay? And it's creating habitat for different things. So when you talk to your clients, you know, you know talk in those terms. I think it makes more sense to people. And this graph is out of the, uh, the guide, so, or the handbook as well. So you'll know, kind of keep this in mind. It, it tells a good story. Because you know, a lot of these things are hard for people to understand and to visualize. But you know, relating it to different, what different vegetation looks like and the types of wildlife they might have, it just gives them a better, a better grounding base. And you know, Dave uh, Jackson did a good job of mentioning this whole thing about invasive species. You know, well, why is you know why are invasives important? You know, um, well, not just because they're bad, but as it's been known, and, and, and Doug Talame of uh, his books has made clear, is that you know caterpillars really don't utilize those invasive species. They don't have those relationships, and as a result, there's much less caterpillar production, much fewer songbirds. That makes sense to people. You know, that might be a justification for them to want to do something about invasive species because they want to see more birds. They want to see more small mammals. So uh, just to, you may want to read some of these books as well. Uh, and I'll mention this later, but Doug Talame that makes a lot of these points. Uh, Julianne did a great job of going through the checklist. And, you know, this is a tool we, we adapted from someone else's stuff, but um, and added our own, you know, own set to it. But, you know, this is something, it's a, it's a work in progress too. So we're interested in feedback uh, on this as well. You know, how does this work for you? Learn how it works for you. So you feel comfortable using it. And um, the same with the, you know, chapter three, we talked about communicating your message and we've kind of been over this, you know, use some of those words perhaps that people, um, you know, more sensitive is, it relate to better. They don't seem as a uh, standoffish and, you know, understand their, their basic interests, which uh, Joe mentioned as well. And we've, we've mentioned a number of times. So, what are those effective messages? Okay, well, I mean, I've mentioned just a couple of them, but a trail improves access to enjoy the outdoors. In this whole COVID area, I mean, there's all this talk about people getting outside, you know, just trying to keep their sanity. <laughs> so, you know, better way to do that, uh, a trail. And I may have mentioned this when I talked earlier that I get calls from people that have many of these small woodlots and I ask them if they've ever been back there. And they say no, because there's no way to get back there. There's no access. So providing an opportunity and a trail that people, so they can get out and recreate and enjoy with their families or whatever, or just enjoy some sanctuary in nature is, is awesome. And this whole issue of nature deficit disorders, you know, is kind of a recognized, uh, you know, disorder that, uh, you know, people need nature. And uh, Richard Louver is a, wrote a book about that. Um, you know, wildlife viewing opportunities by enhancing habitat. We talked about that. Controlling invasives, and we just mentioned why that's important for birds and mass. And of course, long-term woodland health. You know, one thing people do see out of their out of their um, windows in their homes 
is they see where there's a lot of vines and canopies being, you know, uh, been, been impacted. Uh, they see that. And that's something that might resonate with people. Well, you know, you really want to keep these trees healthy for the long term. And I mentioned these two folks, but, uh, you know, Doug Talame, who's done all this work with, that's his first book, Bringing Nature Home, with regards to the effects of, um, you know, native plants on, on, on caterpillars and other things like that. Uh, and, and, uh, and this other book, Richard Louver, you know, Last Child in the Woods, you know, uh, uh, the woods were my riddle and nature calmed me, focused me and yet excited my senses. So these are, two, you know, in all these times, if you're sitting inside, these are two books you might want to to pick up. I, I think they're pretty good. And again, this gives you a dialogue by which to talk to your clients, understanding some of these approaches. I think that's the important aspect of it. Uh, we've talked about the land care practices. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because uh, we know we've almost pretty covered it. But, uh, you know, the lawn to nature, uh, uh, you know, different types of lawn conversions. And this, I'll just point out this one graph on the right or picture. This is actually a development. And what you see here is the original drainage channels. When you think about areas that you may want to actually uh, turn into natural areas, these are the most natural areas to do that because they were existing natural areas. They were existing you know, riparian areas. And uh, they may be in grass now, but they need to be transformed. Uh, different types of things, you know, privacy screens, you know, uh, uh, you know of all kinds. Um, you know, forest buffers, you know, chosen tree management, all the stuff with invasives control and the use of herbicides. These are all covered by Dave Jackson and uh, 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 Craig Highfield and um, the other, oh, I can't think from the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but they did a good job covering that material. And again, like Dave Jackson talked about, you know, he's very much uh, very, very informed in the Penn State publications on the use of uh, applying herbicides are, are some of the best around. Um, and again, the idea of controlling damaging vines like you see here. English ivy, a huge problem in many residential areas. You know, controlling it on the ground and trying to, you know, control it in the trees uh, and herbicides that are definitely an effective way to, to do this. Um, uh, chosen tree management. Well, why is chosen tree management important? I'll tell you one of the biggest reasons, one of the things that people do relate to is that it helps you grow large trees faster. People like big trees. Well, if there's certain trees in the forest that you know you want to see grow faster, and not just for mass for wildlife and things like that, but by using chosen tree management, open up the crown so they can expand, they're gonna grow faster in diameter, just like you see with these two wood cookies on the lower left. You know, that to uh, 25 years, that's the difference in growth from 25 years from a tree that was had an open crown and could grow in the woods and the ones that could. So, um, you know, it's, it's a real thing. Uh, that's a, you know, kind of a, a selling point, I guess. You know, providing wildlife habitat and talked about, you know, improving edge, getting rid of hard edges. Um, and deer, I, I'm just gonna mention this because, you know, I do a lot of stuff with deer damage management and I showed you this picture in one of the earlier webinars if, on the upper left. That area behind the fence is, is fenced off from deer. And this is the effect that deer have. And, and Dave mentioned this as well, is that the impact of, of deer and invasive species on the ability of natives to come back is profound. But for some uh, landowners, they're willing to pay the cost of actually fencing off uh, a property. And there's this low cost, relatively low cost black plastic fencing uh, available um, and all kinds of different fencing systems are relatively easy to put up. This might be something you want to offer to do for a client. Uh, there's a couple of you know, major companies that sell these materials and that very tailored to the residential market, totally tailored to the residential market. Um, you know, deer busters, and there's, there's a couple others. Uh, building the trail, we've talked about that. Uh, so, uh, and Joe did a great job of talking about the land care plan, you know, see how this works for you, see how it'll work. Uh, and the other thing here is that, how do you improve, you can improve your credibility, I think, with other training and certifications. Uh, for most of this woodland work using herbicide, pesticides, you're going to need a commercial pest, forest pesticide applicator's license, uh, which is, you know, can be gotten in any state. Um, but it also opens the opportunity for your work with state cost share contracts and other contracts. And my 
experience with talking with folks in Maryland is that there's not that many people with forest commercial forest herbicide applicators that are eligible to be able to do like these tree plants, small tree plantings that are parts of cost share or state or federal programs and things like this. So it does up, up and up open other opportunities. And uh, again, the USDA programs, the federal programs, uh, they call them technical service providers and some training required. And this is something you can find out from your natural resource conservation service or uh, your local farm services agency. Uh, and those, uh, th those, those can be quite lucrative actually for some of these practices. Uh, finally, there are additional training opportunities out there. Um, these are just a few things I'll mention that are coming up. Uh, Penn State is going to have a nine week webinar series on the Woods in Your Backyard webinar series. Uh, they've been doing this the last two winters. Uh, $45 includes the book. Of course, you already have the book. But, uh, and then we also at the University of Maryland have our Woods in Your Backyard online class in the spring and fall. And that'll start again in March. And you can contact us, uh, go through our website. And uh, that's facilitated by Andrew, in fact, who does a great job. So that's, that's actually you having a person facilitating working with you. You know, you're handing things in, you actually get a certificate of completion. And then the one thing I'll mention, which is brand new, there's a new app there that's just come out from the University of Kentucky. It's called the Healthy Woods app, healthywoodsapp.org. And you can download this on your phone. And it takes you through an assessment of your woodland with pictures and other things. And uh, I think it has a lot of application. Uh, it's, it's still no, I can't really deal with it, but I would just encourage you to download it and check it out. Very easy to use. Uh, final thoughts. Consider your own capabilities and interests. Is this type of uh, services provided? Is this for you? Uh, if it is, I would suggest starting with some of the existing clients that are receptive. You know, and you may, you know, have those folks uh, not adverse to management. They're they're interested in the many protection. Perhaps they have disposable income, um, or you know, offer this you know the, the consulting for the the checklist or the land care plan as a free service. You know, to a few of your clients. So that you can learn how to do it, you know, so that you're not under pressure to produce necessarily, but, but you're learning as you go along. And that's, that's a good way, I think, to get started so that you feel competent and credible. And you'll see what the, the issues are that when they come up so that uh, uh, you're, you're offering a quality service when you actually start to charge for it. Um, experiment on your own property. Involve your own family. Um, and I think finally, it's to say, is to follow up with us here. Uh, we'd like to visit with some of you. And uh, if, if, if you are doing some of these practices, really encourage you to give us a call in your respective states. And um, I know for us, we'd like to come out and visit with you and maybe talk with you and learn from you because I think this is a, a whole thing that's in progress. And um, you're going to be getting a, a end of session webinar uh, a survey right when we're done here after the questions and all. Uh, but we also are going to send everybody a six month follow up. And for us, this is absolutely critical. Really can't. It's all, you know, you, you don't know who you are. Um, uh, it's anonymous and all that, but it really gives us the, the fuel by which that we can continue to carry this program on. So when that thing comes in email six months from now or so, whatever comes out, please respond. Um, so with that, this is uh, our partnership, and we're really thankful that you attended all these sessions. And uh, on behalf of, my, of Julianne and Joe and myself for this week, um, we, we thank you for being here. And I think at this point, I'm going to unshare and take it back to Agnes, who will uh, has a few things to say, and then um, I guess we'll deal with questions. Hello, took me a minute to get adjusted there. Hi, everybody. So uh, thanks, what great speakers today um, for the introduction to the Woodland Health Assessment and the checklist. Um, great review on that. Uh, we had a few questions in the chat. I know we're a little over time, but I did wanna get to the chat. Um, a question here was, how do you balance an unhealthy amount of deadwood in a suburban area, such as from vines, invasive species, emerald ash borer that would normally be kept in check from fires, which is historically suppressed, and this can increase 
its fire potential. Deadwood is a, in a large intact forest is one thing, but it is not the same in a forest fragment, in forest fragment, and it seems like there could be too much. So how do you ba balance the unhealthy amount of deadwood in suburban areas? I'll, I'll try to tackle that a little bit, uh, Agnes. Um, you know, that's pretty complex. Uh, one thing when, when we look at deadwood, especially in more populated areas, uh, we look at potential targets of standing trees. Uh, you know, if there's a bunch of standing dead trees, uh, if they're around a home or around a yard or near places where where the targets might be people or children or or structures, you know, obviously, you know, they need to be taken care of. Um, if if it's on the ground, um, you know, that's that's another thing. Um, it's it's hard to say. You know that that you can say, oh my gosh, you know it's a huge fire hazard. Um, theoretically, it could be, but chances are, you know, in in our portion of the United States, it's not. Um, in in some of the mountain subdivisions, yes, a, a quantity of downwood can definitely be, uh, you know, a, a fire problem. Uh, so each situation is very different. I, I think the, the primary, uh, you know, goal that, or reason that we would recommend the removal of Deadwood is, is just for safety uh, and the value of, of life and property. Great. Any other? Me, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll comment. On, I, I had a comment to that because I, I think what you see in a lot of these uh, in development areas and some of these small woodlot areas is just, you know, a lot of invasives, uh, you know, a lot of... Uh, maybe uh, poor quality trees and they've, they've degraded to a certain extent for one reason or another. And, you know, in many cases, there's just not a really good canopy. You know, you have all kinds of vines intertwining in the canopies, which they don't develop. So you never really get a closed canopy in many cases. And then you have all the invasives and, you know, it, it's not an easy situation and like dead stuff on the ground. And as a practitioner, I mean, what do you do with that? Well, it's, it's difficult, but the one thing you can do is if you can control some of the invasives, if, if you can actually find some, some good seedlings or native trees that have actually come in and, you know, use something like chosen tree management to kind of nurse those along and trying to create and control some of the vines in the overstory to, so you can actually get a closed canopy that stops the light from coming into the understory and which makes, you know, those invasives just be able to take over more. So. Joe's right. It's 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 complex, but uh, there are a few things you probably can do. Thanks, guys. Julianne, uh, I think this one is for you. Can you help define what a stream crossing is? So stream crossings would be areas that perhaps you put bridges in, or where you have uh, animals crossing. Uh, I know that's actually uh, a term used with um, um, agriculture is the stream crossings, but in our landscaped, landscaped areas, it would be more where people put areas that you can get across. So they might put stones in, they might put a little log bridge, whether it's legal or not, or so anywhere you're getting over that stream as without getting wet <laughs> as safely as possible. So putting in that stream crossing, that bridge or whatever you're suggesting there helps with so that sediment doesn't get in that stream and we're keeping trying to keep that integrity of the stream, right? Yes. And having less stream crossings and more work moving to areas to cross, <laughs> you know, just focusing your areas where to cross. Right. That, yeah, that trail, that trail, I'm thinking of that trail building and being very deliberate with having that planned out well. Yes. Yes. I agree. So the next question here, what price range would work for hourly? Any suggestions? I don't know if people want to type that in the chat too. If you, if you have any suggestions, I see later on that people were giving uh, some links out to things, but 
what what do you all think here? What is it, what price range would work for industry do you, for hourly for hourly? Well, I I just want to mention hourly should take into consideration all of your costs prorated out. So that's going to mean your equipment that you'll use for that, your travel time, your gas, your insurance, things like that. So that's what you put into that. Um, I wanted to draw your attention to another website, Edge of the Woods Nursery. It's a native plant nursery. And there on that website, she lists what they charge for uh, a design plan with recommendations. So she's doing some of that work there uh, and she didn't wanna be given away too much as, as they say. And so I just wanted to draw your attention to that as an example of one. Yeah, one thing I'll mention too, um... Agnes and Julianne is, is that sometimes, uh, you know, what might happen is you kind of have to, you kind of have to get into it, you know, set an hourly rate. It may work for you well, it may not work for you well. Uh, you may have to adjust, um, you know, and, and so it's, it's a little bit trial and error, uh, especially when you're trying some of these, these newer practices that you've never done before. Um, and so consequently, it's, it's one of these, it's a learning process, no doubt about it. Uh, and, and you may find out that, you know, you just can't do it. Um, but, uh, you know, overall, I think you'll find that sweet spot uh, that, that you'll be able to settle upon uh, that is going to be acceptable to the client and that you're still making money. And this is reminding me of Jonathan's tip at the end there with, um, going with existing clients that you already have as you're trying to kind of form that and, and figure that out. Um, so then this kind of relates, how about uh, an hourly rate for creating the plan? And I think that kind of got addressed there. And Jonathan also suggested for the first few, um, maybe offering that for free. And another question about relative rates for planning, inspecting and installing practices. So I think we kind of answered that right there. Um, so that machine, that forestry mulcher and mower, I, I thought it was really interesting. Somebody asked, uh, wanted to be reminded what type of machine that was. And Jonathan, you said something really interesting that you can rent one of those. So um, who would you go about calling to get a service like that? Well, I mean, there's a number of companies. I think one person here mentioned, I mean, they, you really not, I mean, you, I guess you can rent the machine yourself, but um, it just depends on the person. I mean, you both these come with an operator and uh, in many cases who does what needs to be done is experienced with the machine. So, I mean, you know, if you're ex experienced machine operator, perhaps you can rent this stuff, but uh, I'd be very, you know, cautious for most people. That wouldn't be the way to go. Like I said, we did this on our, our property here at the university and it was uh, 1500 hours a day. I'll tell you, that's what it was up in here in, in Western Maryland uh, for an eight hour day with an operator and dropping the truck off, you know, picking up and dropping off the machine. And uh, I think you could probably do about four to six acres a day. And that's just chopping down the understory, not, not, not digging into the soil really too much, just kind of getting everything off. And, uh, now, whether that would hold everywhere, I don't know. That was like 10 to 12 foot uh, bush honeysuckle and autumn olive and other stuff. How did you find them? Well, you just ask them, look around. I mean, there's there's places that do this kind of work that do uh, land clearing and do uh, uh, that kind of work. So, I mean, they're around. Okay, so a land there's a lot clearing. Of, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of land clearing, so. <laughs> okay, so like a land clearing company or something like that. So somebody or it could was be asking, a landscaping company. It pardon? could be a landscaping company as well. It could be a landscaping company as well. Some of the larger landscaping and companies and others, uh, you know, have have those types of machines. I'm not. 
I'm noticing the time, it's 8.34. Um, Andrew, if you could please put the link into the survey for people to get continuing education credit. So Andrew will put that in, making sure that everybody's name is with their register, same as their registration name when they fill in that continuing education credit survey. We'll continue on with the questions for maybe about another 10 minutes, but I don't wanna hold us up, okay? You guys, I, I'm taking note of the time. Hey, Agnes, um, can I just mention, can I just reinforce one thing um, that, you know, as we go through this, um, I mentioned this at the end of what I said, but if folks, you know, really, uh, we really appreciate talking to people who get into this and are doing this to learn from you guys. So feel free to contact, you know, the respective people in your states that have been instructors here, and uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to, to hear from you. Thank you. And let me remind everybody, um, if I, oh. Let me remind everybody who our partners were. Okay, so um, thank you for joining us. A follow-up survey will come in about the next two weeks, and then um, the core the this webinar series will go online in maybe about another month, two months, something like that. I wanted to thank our partners, uh, especially the Harry Hughes uh, Center for Agroecology, who helped start us up here, Virginia Cooperative Extension. Uh, Virginia Department of Forestry, Penn State Extension, University of Maryland Extension, hey, and uh, Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so let's continue on with some of these questions. Um, there was one, somebody was asking about um, uh, Johnson grass and kind of some tips on that. Yeah, Johnson grass, you know, it's one of those, um, it's not necessarily a one and done. Uh, I know that uh, glyphosate has been used, uh, you know, to, to control it. Uh, I read um, somewhere online that, that uh, close uh, mowing uh, would control it over time. But uh, uh, from what I've seen, you know, in my experience, it takes more than uh, close mowing to control it. Um, you know, it can be a beast. Uh, it's got seeds. It's got rhizomes that it will sprout from. Um, you know, the, the roots are um, kind of long and fibrous and, uh, you know, it can definitely take over an area. Uh, so, it, you know, it may take a while uh, to turn around a field full of Johnson grass into something you want it to be like a meadow. Um, and even, you know, even if, if you're thinking of a wildflower meadow or a warm season grass meadow or a combination thereof, you may still have to spot treat the Johnson grass, you know, later on, um, you know, just to try to keep it in check uh, because it can be very aggressive without a doubt. Uh, so it'll, it'll take probably a few different cultural practices to try to control it um, and, and patience. And, and that's something that your clients, you know, would, would have to uh, be ready to endure, you know, is, is both patience and monetary outlay uh, get rid of that stuff. Great. And um, I, I liked hearing the uh, questions of who to partner with. And one of the questions was, is there somebody in Maryland um, that would be good for stream restoration partners? Um, Jonathan, if you want to, if you have any suggestions, um, I know that extension, you can call C Grant Extension. If you want to call me, I can um, set you up with um, the watershed uh, sea grant extension agent for your area. I don't know if Jonathan has any other suggestions for that. Yeah, I just put in uh, also soil conservation, the soil conservation district in your county. Uh, and the good thing with them is they have a lot of cost share programs and other funding available for, for actual projects on the ground, so. We're getting some great accolades there, you guys. Thank you for the series. And somebody was saying about the continuing education credit link again. If we can put that in the chat box again, that'd be great, Andrew. Thank you. Um, any recommendations on how to control invasive earthworms? What is best to manage? Hey, you know, if we could get those, uh, put a bunch of those uh, invasive earthworms on a on a hook, and go get some snakeheads. We'd be doing a lot of good, wouldn't we? Any other suggestions about uh, invasive earthworms? 
I don't know, but it'd be great if we could figure out how they control Johnson grass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think I'm, that's not I my think area, so that might be a research project, Jonathan. <laughs> Get a lot of fishermen. <laughs> yeah, seriously, and and you know, not to make light of it, um, but uh, yeah, you know, invasive earthworms are are you know just a, a whole new frontier of invasive species, without a doubt. And um, you know, it would be a truly unique uh, service for a service provider uh, if you know they ever thought about going down that that avenue, um, and they might be the only one in the state who would offer invasive earthworm control. Julianne, did you want to add something there? <laughs> yes, because I, I know of some people who've done research in the Philadelphia parks and uh, they spread from streams on because it's the fishermen that after they're done fishing, release their worms and they are huh. The giant invasive ones and they are just wreaking havoc so i don't know of a management or control measure but i do know that they would try different substances on them and mustard repelled them but i do not know of anything that's labeled or any other technique Dijon mustard or just the plain yellow mustard <laughs> plain yellow. <laughs> hello can you hear me yeah. yeah. Hi. Oh, um, so yes. The, yes. The, the invasive earthworms, um, there's been some studies in Philadelphia done where lowering soil pH has affected the population. Hmm. And so treating with uh, sulfur uh, to, to reduce uh, pH levels has uh, shown to be effective uh, if done in three uh, years in succession. It's not necessarily uh, all that uh, achievable on a large forest track, but in smaller areas, it can be done. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. That's really interesting. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. And, and hi, I, I know he was one of, he worked at one of the inception sites <laughs> where it started, the school kill center there. So Andrew put the link for last week's recording in the chat box. He put that in at 826. If you're looking in the chat box at 826, Andrew put in the link for the last webinar. Um, and there at 827, Adam Downing, one of our partners, he put in the link for um, the service providers in Virginia. Uh, any advice for clearing thick invasive patches on thick on steep slopes? Clearing thick invasive patches on steep slopes. Jonathan, you want to take that? I think the same. I mean, I think the same thing they would do on 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 level slopes. Really, I mean, would be to kind of can you know you wouldn't want to totally remove all the vegetation, but to you know killing the above ground portion probably be the best. I mean. The roots will still stay in the root in, in the ground for a while and other things will come in but uh um i mean either mechanically or with or with herbicides i mean i'm, I'm not sure uh I, I wouldn't use equipment because of you know probably ripping things up too much but um i i want to just share with you that several of my municipalities because we have quite a few steep slopes and usually they're like a long pen dot roads and they've just cleared it all the way down and it just grows up in invasive. Oh. And they have successfully used goats. And we have some goat vendors out here mm -hmm. that will um, bring their people in sight and then leave their goats in um, gated areas uh, and they will just eat it down and it has to be eaten down for several years <laughs> or come in with uh, then a, a herbicide because many of the goats, they like steep, they're good climbers. So something like that's like fun for them. Yeah, hungry, good climbers. The only, yeah, the only thing is and, and the goats work, there's no question, but they're just, it's extremely, it's very, very expensive. It's something that municipalities and folks who have those kind of funds can afford. Uh, you're right it works it's just very very expensive 
they they get the one, such a claim for it. <laughs> yeah, the one thing that amazed yeah, me. Yeah. yeah, the one thing that amazed me about the goats is they stayed in the area with a single strand of electric fence uh, that was run off a solar charger. Great. All right, you guys, there was lots of great discussion and I'm sorry if I hastily missed your question. I'm just taking note of the time. And if you do have a question that's burning, please, we do wanna hear from you. I love that Jonathan said that we wanna get updates. We want to report to other people what y'all are doing, what successes you're having and how you've, uh, if you've had any challenges and how you've found the solutions for them. Please keep us updated, keep us connected. Um, we'd love to hear from you and stay connected. And uh, we're also uh, grateful when you fill out that survey in two weeks. And then again, like Jonathan mentioned, that um, six month survey later on down the road. So thank you from everybody from the uh, Woods in Your Backyard Partnership. We're really glad that you joined us on this series and we appreciate your input and the time you took with us before Thursday. Somebody asked, what are you gonna do on Thursday? I don't know. <laughs> well, maybe we'll start another Thursday evening webinar series. <laughs> give, give us some topics. <laughs> All right, you guys, have a good night. Take care. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Have a good evening.